Stalin's War on Religion, a Human Now original documentary. The Soviet Union has an extensive history of persecuting followers of religion. However, between the years of 1929 and 1941, the Soviet Union experienced a period of heightened religious repression under Joseph Stalin's regime. Religious gatherings were suppressed, and religious followers were targeted by the state in attempts to create an atheist society. Atheism was a long-standing goal of communist ideologues, and Stalin was no exception. Although Stalin held communist beliefs, he targeted religion not with the sole intention of fulfilling his ideology, but instead as a practical way of solidifying his own power. Stalin's process of religious repression may begin to be understood through communist doctrine itself. This includes the teachings of Karl Marx, the anti-religious precedent set by Vladimir Lenin, leading into Stalin's policies, and Stalin's own view on religion. The anti-religious policies taken by Stalin include direct actions, such as his law and religious associations, and reshaping of the Gregorian calendar, social actions, such as the support of the League of Militant Godless, and the culmination of anti-religious repression during the Great Purge. The proof of Stalin's power-oriented motive for repression of religion may be drawn from the state undermining influence religion gives individuals, and his relaxation of aggressive anti-religious policies during and after World War II when it served his own purpose. The teachings of German philosopher Karl Marx were responsible for the political ideology of communism. Marx largely concerned himself with attempting to explain the laws of history, specifically with a focus on the economic means of production. Marx divided the world into oppressive bourgeoisie factory owners and the downtrodden working class proletariat. In addition to economics, Marx also addressed the issue of religion, writing, quote, Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people, end quote. As a tool of the oppressors, religion subdued the masses much like a drug obscures reality to its users. To Marx, religion was illusionary happiness, which prevented real happiness in the form of communism from occurring. Followers of Marx did not see themselves as simply following an ideology, but instead as following objective science itself. Religion represented backwardness and delusion, while communism represented science and progress. Vladimir Lenin, the Soviet Union's first leader, implemented anti-religious policies which were justified by the teachings of Marx. These policies would later help lay the groundwork for Stalin's own policies. Lenin proclaimed that the entire Marxist outlook on religion should be based upon Marx's opium of the people quotation. Lenin elaborated, writing that Marxism, quote, has always regarded all modern religions and churches and each and every religious organization as instruments of the bourgeoisie reaction that serve to defend exploitation and to befuddle the working class, end quote. It was clear to Lenin and his Bolshevik party that religion was simply used by the ruling class to keep the masses in thrall. When the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917, they promised to create a new civilization and sweep away the old. In addition to economic, cultural, and political restructuring, religion was targeted. In order to achieve his communist utopia, Lenin adopted the policy of state atheism. Atheism in the Soviet Union was not the same as emotionless, quote, bourgeoisie atheism, which saw God as a philosophical question. Instead, Soviet atheism was seen as a scientific truth and deliberately partisan, just like communism. Lenin declared a separation between church and state on January 20th, 1918. The decree on separation of church and state nationalized church property, removed recognition of religious entities as legal entities, stopped religious education in schools, turned birth, marriage, and death all into civil matters. It removed religious symbols and rituals from public life and allowed for the following of any or no religion. Priests were targeted during this time by being denied the right to vote, forced into paying higher taxes, and given restricted access to state resources such as rationing and housing, two very important things. Due to their treatment, many religious officials aligned with the White Army during the Russian Civil War, a decision that would lead to the death of 28 bishops and several thousand clergymen at the hand of Lenin's secret police dubbed the Cheka and the Red Army itself. 
After the Civil War, religious organizations were seen by Lenin as a remnant of the enemy and a final threat to the complete state power. Although Lenin engaged in anti-religious policies such as sending soldiers to seize religious artifacts and sell them for famine in 1922, there was not a clear consensus among Bolsheviks on how to remove religion from society. There were debates as to whether religion would simply wither away as society progressed if long-term education of science and rationality was the answer, or if the state should forcefully eliminate religion through ideological, legal, and repressive means. Lenin's successor Stalin would opt for the latter. Stalin's view on religion shaped his aggressive anti-religious policies. Stalin was first introduced to Marxism in his youth while attending the Tiflis Theological Seminary. Stalin was eventually expelled from this seminary school when he became a Marxist. After some time of political activism in the Caucasus, Stalin became known to Lenin and slowly made his way into the Bolshevik party structure. Given his close ties to Lenin and the theories of Marx, it is unsurprising Stalin developed similar anti-religious thoughts. Stalin's view differed, however, as he took a much more repressive approach to dealing with religion. Marx only provided an ideological basis for religion's removal, and Lenin failed to completely remove religion from Soviet society. Stalin believed that, like the Kulaks, religion could be liquidated. In 1932, the League of Militant Godless, an organization founded in 1925 to promote atheism, announced under the orders of Stalin that by 1937, quote, not a single house of prayer shall remain in the territory of the USSR, and the very concept of God must be banished from the Soviet Union, end quote. Stalin's government saw religion as the only legally existing counter-revolutionary force, such a hardline view of atheism encapsulates Stalin's anti-religious policy and his war on religion. Soon after consolidating his power over the Soviet Union, Stalin would implement laws to directly repress religious citizens. While unintended to target religious institutions, Stalin shifted focus towards denouncing religion as a whole. The Law on Religious Associations, issued on April 8, 1929, was one of Stalin's early and most significant anti-religious policies. It sought to remove religion by narrowing its borders of legality within the Soviet Union and to bring all aspects of religious life under state control. The Law on Religious Associations resulted in the banning of public worship, closing of religious buildings, removal of church bells, heavy taxation on functioning congregations, and the mass arrest of clergymen. Furthermore, almost every sort of religious activity was made illegal, including producing or distributing religious literature, and even raising money for charity. Religious associations of at least 20 adults would face a difficult process of obtaining legitimacy by having to apply for permission to operate and prove they have a religious building in which they would worship from. These local associations were the only legal religious structures recognized by the Soviet Union. In the same year, Stalin introduced the continuous five-day week. The five-day week reshaped the previous Gregorian calendar into 365 days, with six five-day weeks equating into one month. Citizens were assigned different days of work and days off. Stalin enacted this dramatic change to increase factory production. However, there was a deliberate anti-religious element. Sunday, a shared day of rest when Christians could gather at church, no longer existed. Similarly, Friday no longer existed for Muslims as a holy day, and Saturday no longer existed for Jews. There were no designated religious holidays, instead only five revolutionary holidays. Such actions by Stalin damaged the ability for individuals to exercise their religious observance. In addition to state law, Stalin also fostered social anti-religious behavior. Decentralized movements were encouraged to promote anti-religious propaganda so that Stalin's atheist subjective would appear to be a spontaneous desire of the masses rather than a government initiative. One of the most prominent anti-religious social organizations was the League of Militant Godless. Although the League of Militant Godless were founded in 1925, in June 1929 they gained extensive powers by Stalin to launch their renewed campaign to destroy religion. By 1932, the League had five and a half million members, two million more than the Communist Party itself. 
The League sought to bring atheism to the masses by promoting anti-religious propaganda through their newspaper entitled The Godless. Journals, posters, lectures, and demonstrations. One of their posters reads, quote, The struggle against religion is the struggle for socialism, end quote, while depicting two strong, red-colored men who are about to drive their tract over various religious caricatures. A key part of society targeted by Stalin and his social organizations was academia. Now, Lenin removed religion in schools, however it was not replaced by atheism. Instead, schools simply became irreligious. However, under Stalin, higher educational institutions were made to be actively anti-religious through purges. The League contributed to the attack on academia by establishing anti-religious departments within the universities themselves. The repressive laws and social attitudes of Stalin's regime culminated between the years of 1937 and 1938 in what came to be known as the Great Purge. During the Great Purge, Stalin's paranoia infiltrated all aspects of civil life, resulting in the death or imprisonment of one and a half to five million Soviet citizens. If a citizen was arrested, their friends and family were targeted soon after. Stalin sought to purge any alleged dissident element of society. Now, due to the historical context of communist doctrine, religious members were a prime target. The Orthodox Church was accused of collaborating with domestic religious underground organizations, as well as counter-revolutionary agents abroad. The 1929 Law on Religious Associations was now seen as too permissive towards religion, and anti-religious policy was further intensified. Between 1937 and 1938, 14,000 churches were closed, and 35,000, quote, servants of religious cults, end quote, were arrested. 168,300 members of the Orthodox Church clergy were arrested, and 106,300 were killed. Despite such an extreme war on religion waged by Stalin, religion ultimately prevailed. A 1937 census of 98,412 people saw 56.17% of respondents identify as believers. This number would rise to two-thirds in rural areas. In 1939, the census removed the question on religion to avoid this unfortunate social reality to Stalin. However, when they requested, quote, citizens of which state, end quote, various respondents wrote, Christian, or orthodox. Despite Stalin's reference to communist doctrine during his war on religion, his true motive was to solidify his own power. Stalin attempted to depict religious followers as subversive to the revolution and incompatible with a communist utopia. However, many religious individuals worshipped in the Soviet Union without posing any threat to the governing authority. This is especially true in the countryside. Given this is the case, why would Stalin delegate the amount of effort he did into targeting followers of religion? Religion undermined Stalin's power. Instead of being a strong counter-revolutionary force, religion simply provided a guide to life for the individual unique from that of the communist state. God's authority was placed above the state, giving him more power than Stalin. The Torah, Bible, or Quran's teachings transcended the teachings of Marx, Lenin, or Stalin in the minds of religious followers. Religious texts received more authority than those which the Communist Party based their authority upon. By extension, religious institutions who preached the word of God could be seen as rivaling the political influence of Stalin in the minds of believers. Religion provides a unique set of moral principles which cannot be changed. Without religion, the state decides social moral principles which citizens must adhere to. For example, the mass murder of alleged enemies of the revolution is acceptable under Stalin's moral code, but not that of most religions. The war on religion was not waged with the sole intention of fulfilling communist doctrine, but instead, it served to benefit Stalin himself. The war on religion would solidify Stalin's political power by stopping the political influence of religious institutions and solidify his social power by suppressing the beliefs of individual religious followers. Further evidence that Stalin's war on religion was based on his desire for power rather than following of communist doctrine can be seen with his shift in attitude during World War II. 
When German soldiers occupied parts of the Soviet Union, they began to encourage the revival of religion among inhabitants by reopening churches. This was a deliberate attempt to undermine Stalin's regime. In June 1941, at the time of Germany's invasion, there were several hundred churches across German-occupied Soviet territory, such as Ukraine and Belarusia. By 1944, this number reached approximately 10,000. Continuing to pursue anti-religious policy would hurt Stalin's rule, as it could encourage Nazi sympathy among Christian followers within occupied lands. Inside Soviet-controlled territories, the Nazi invasion created a rise in patriotism among Orthodox Church followers. Stalin recognized that he could use religion for his own power by tying the Orthodox Church to Russian national identity. In this process, Stalin relaxed many of his anti-religious policies. Although the church was unable to practice social welfare and education, they were able to grow their clergy and parishes, reopen a small number of monasteries and theological schools, raise income, and could rent or construct buildings. In September 1943, Stalin allowed the election of Sergei to transpire, and he became Patriarch of the Orthodox Church. This marked a significant shift in Stalin's relationship with religion. Stalin undermined the anti-religious communist doctrine, which he based his own previous anti-religious policies upon, when it helped him to maintain power. Stalin's pre-World War II regime saw a period of heightened repression, with religious gatherings suppressed and religious members targeted. Stalin attempted to create an atheist society justified by communist doctrine but ultimately fueled by personal power. The basis for Stalin's actions can be understood through the teachings of Marx, the anti-religious precedent by Lenin, and Stalin's own views on religion. Stalin's anti-religious policies can be analyzed by being broken down into direct actions such as his law and religious associations and reshaping of the calendar, social action such as support for the League of Militant Godless's activity, and the culmination of anti-religious repression during his Great Purge. By understanding Stalin's context and actions, his power-oriented motives can be analyzed in relation to the state-undermining influence of religion and his eventual relaxation of anti-religious policies when it served to maintain his position of power. You've been listening to Stalin's War on Religion, a Human Now original documentary. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing for more content such as this. Also, you can find us on Instagram at human.now. Thanks for listening.